Uh, my name's Gavin Martin. I'm from Cornerstone Wealth. And I'll just be walking you through a couple of the more complex Centrelink strategies this evening. Uh, Nathan Buttergeg normally intros the session, but he's in uh, interstate uh, this evening. So, uh, so I don't think Nathan's going to uh, call in. So just a disclaimer about this evening. It is advice of a general nature only. Please take it of that, as that and uh, seek your own personal advice um, uh, before making any decisions. Uh, if you do want to seek personal specific advice, um, the way that we assist you is that we help you uh, by firstly requesting that you complete a questionnaire. Um, then we meet with you for an initial consultation and that's really about understanding your goals, uh, where your what your current circumstances are and then talking through the pros and cons of the range of options available to you. That still really is general advice. If you want specific advice, uh, then uh, we can we need to do that in writing and that's called a statement of advice. We present that to you in what we call a strategy presentation. We can also help you implement it and provide ongoing advice as well. So you can take that process as far along as you need to or want to. Uh, in terms of where we're at in uh, the webinars that we've conducted in the last few months, we did a three retirement planning webinars. If you didn't catch those and they're relevant to you, then you can get them at the Cornerstone Wealth website at, at um, cornerstonewealth.com.au forward slash retire 2015, TTR 2015 and CGT 2015. Really good if you're particularly if you're uh, still working and uh, approaching retirement or uh, in that uh, transition phase, so you've you've reached a preservation age of uh, 55 or 56 or more, and um, and able to take advantage of those particular strategies. Uh, otherwise, all the webinars are available at Christian Super's website. Uh, it's easy just to negotiate to free stuff, videos, and previous webinars to get all the webinar recordings and any future webinars. This is the last one for the year, though. Um, uh, we've also done a series of two um, Centrelink webinars. As I've mentioned earlier, uh, if you haven't already caught the Centrelink Age Pension webinar, it goes into all the basics. And tonight we're going to cover off some of the more detailed strategies. But you can get that either at Centrelink 2015 on the Cornerstone Wealth website or at Christian Super's website as well. Uh, so just the uh, tapping on, uh, touching on some of the, the very basics. So what is your age? Pension age is a key one to understand. It's based on your date of birth. Uh, so check out your date of birth. Um, uh, this is for, for women. Um, it's, it's increasing to 65 over time. And uh, for men, it's uh, increasing, uh, of men and women, uh, it's increasing from 65 to 67, depending on your date of birth. So check out your date of birth. Work out what your age, pension age, and that's the age at which you're eligible for the pension. Once you've worked out whether you're eligible or what age you're eligible, you may be eligible for, uh, for if you're a single person, up to 22542 per annum, or if you're a couple, uh, it's currently 16991 per annum that you may be eligible for. So that's each member of the couple is eligible for that amount. Um, now, you might be, uh, that's the maximum rate you could potentially get, but it depends on uh, an income test and an assets test as to how much you will get in relation to the age pension. Now, the lower rates apply. So both tests are applied and whichever test provides the lowest um, uh, pension rate, that's the test that will apply to you, the income test or the asset test. Now, the main strategy that we're going to talk about tonight is is the one around uh, what happens when only one member of the couple is of age pension age. Now, I implement this strategy on a regular basis, uh, but I've not uh, tried to explain it before in a, in a lot of detail or in a webinar, so uh, hopefully I can get the message across um, for you. Uh, so what happens when one member is eligible for the age pension and one isn't? Uh, well, basically, the same income test applies, income and asset test applies. So if um, yeah, you could be eligible, but, but uh, you only get half of the, uh, the couple's pension rate. So only the al- person eligible for the age pension could get the $16,991 per annum. And to get that full amount, your income per fortnight needs to be below $288 per fortnight. If it's more than that, then it scales uh, back and it uh, scales back at a rate of $0.25 cents per fortnight um, uh, of this amount. 
uh, for every dollar over that limit, over that $288. We'll walk through some examples to make it clearer. If you want to go through some more detailed scenarios, go back to that webinar recording in relation to uh, the, the previous Center, Centrelink webinar. Um, the person who is age pension age will get no pension, no age pension, if their income is over $2,902 per fortnight or uh, $75,452 per annum. So this is where if you've got a spouse that's or or both of you potentially that are still working and you're earning over $75,500, then you're not going to get any age pension. Now, it's still potentially the best thing to do for you to continue to work or both continue to work or one of you to continue to work because you're going to get um, a lot more earning over $75,000, then you are getting the age pension of $17,000. But if, for example, you have chosen to or needed to uh, retire, um, either uh, the a younger spouse or the spouse of age pension age, uh, then you can consider how to best structure your situation to maximise the age pension that you're eligible for. And you could potentially get that full amount if you are both... Um, uh, uh, both retired. A key thing to understand, and we walked through this in the previous webinar, is what does income include? Well, it includes your gross earnings from employment, and there's not much we can do about salary. We can't reduce it by salary sacrificing because the salary sacrifice is included within the income test. We can factor in uh, what we call a work bonus in that you can earn up to $6,500 Uh, each year without it impacting your age pension. So, for example, if um, the person eligible for the age pension only earned $6,500 throughout the year, they could earn $6,500 from employment income and have other income of $7,488 per annum and they would still be eligible for the full age pension, could potentially get that nearly $17,000 whilst still earning the combination of these two amounts. So the work bonus applies only to the person who is age pension age, uh, not the spouse, not the younger spouse. Income includes overseas income, rent from real estate, farm and business income, income streams and superannuation pensions and deemed income from financial investments. So just to cover off that, it's the basics of what income includes. Assets include your cars, boats, caravans, household contents, bank accounts and investments, uh, real estate, farm and businesses, antiques, collectibles and giftings. Now, this is the important bit, what it does not include. So assets do not include accommodation bond paid for aged care, uh, funeral bonds and prepaid funerals, And it doesn't include your own home. It doesn't include special disability trusts. And it doesn't, and this is the key part to this particular strategy that I'm uh, about to introduce, is it doesn't include superannuation or rollovers investments up to, up until the age pension age. So this is where if the spouse who is under age pension age can hold assets in their superannuation and it, and it is excluded from the assets test for Centrelink purposes. So the whole strategy that I'm going to talk through is how you can maximise the age pension of the older spouse that's eligible for the age pension by holding assets in the accumulation phase of superannuation of the younger spouse. It's easiest to walk through an example. We've got Sam and Sally here. Uh, Sam and is um, 65 years of age and eligible for the age pension and Sally is 57 years of age. Um, So there's an eight-year gap, but there's actually a 10-year gap in terms of when Sally will be eligible for the age pension because her age pension age is 67 years of age. Uh, So there's a a larger gap there. So in terms of assets, they've got a house worth $800,000. They've got a cash of $40,000. They've got Christian pensions of $600,000 and they've got shares of $100,000. Now in terms of what age pension they'll be eligible for, you need to firstly exclude the family home because that's not a tested asset for Centrelink purposes. And then the calculation is... They've got Christian pensions of 600, which are included in the assets test, cash of 40, shares of 100, and then the total assets tested are $740,000. If they're both retired, <clears throat> we're not factoring in the income test here. Uh, but we're assuming that they're both retired, they're both not working. 
but Sam could be earning $6,500 from employment income and it still wouldn't impact these calculations. In terms of the total assets that are tested, um, it's $740,000. There's a lower asset threshold of $291,500 for a couple at the moment. And that means they're 448500 over the asset test threshold, which means that using the current taper rates, now this is going to double to $3 on the 1st of Jan 2017, but under the current taper rate, their fortnightly pension will reduce by six hundred and seventy two seventy five because of the asset or because of the assets that are over the lower threshold. The full pension available to them if they were both eligible is as one thousand three hundred and seven per fortnight. It's reduced by the taper rate based on their assets. So a couple's fortnightly pension that they would be eligible for if they were both eligible is six hundred and thirty four dollars and twenty five cents. But because only Sam's eligible, he's only going to get three hundred and seventeen dollars and thirteen cents per fortnight under the current rules. So what can we do? What can Sam and Sally do uh, to increase that pension amount to increase it closer to the half of the thirteen hundred and seven dollars? Well, that's what we're trying to aim for. So what we can do is we can juggle their assets round so that we are moving assets that are testable so uh, into assets that are not testable. So currently Sally's got no money in her Christian super account, but they've got their $600,000 of assets are made up of $440,000 in Sam's Christian pension, $160,000 in Sally's Christian pension, the shares that we talked about, and $40,000 in cash. So the first thing we can do is cash out uh, all of Sam's superannuation, uh, sorry, Christian pension balance, and we can put it into the bank account. The second thing we can do is roll back Sally's Christian pension to her Christian super account. So it's not coming out of the superannuation environment. It's just going from the pension phase to the accumulation or super phase is what we sometimes call it. The third thing that we could potentially do is sell the shares uh, that are held in joint names. Key thing there that you need to factor in is that if there's capital gains tax applicable, you might need to manage that as well. And there's some strategies that we talked about in the third webinar in the retirement series that can help you manage that. So now we've got all of the assets out of... um, Sam's Christian pension, Sally's Christian pension, and shares held jointly, and it's now in the bank account. So in the bank, we've currently got $580,000. Now they can make a contribution, a non-concessional contribution, into Sally's superannuation account of $540,000 to add to $160,000 that will bring her total to $700,000 in her superannuation account. Now at this point in time, the only asset that is tested here is the $40,000 in the bank account. What will need to happen is that because you're only receiving potentially the, the 17, just under $17,000 that Sam might be receiving, you'll need to use the bank account to live on because it may not, the 17000 is not likely going to be enough for you to live on. So over time, you might eat into your bank account to the point that if it gets down to three, uh, you know, a uh, a minimal amount, you may need to draw some lump sums from Sally's Christian super account. Now, generally, we try to um, make those withdrawals as infrequent as possible because there's a $50 charge for those uh, to come out of your Christian super account. But on the counter side of that, we don't want to have too many assets here if it's going to push us up over the assets test and end up reducing our pension. Um, But you might need to do that several times depending on how long uh, you were going to run with this strategy. So you might draw another uh, as your account balance reduces as you're using that money to spend on um, your living expenses. You might need to draw another $20,000 out of or, or whatever the amount is out of the superannuation account. Now an important thing here is that if Sally is still working, if she's um, fully employed and she's 58, she won't be able to make make these lump sum withdrawals without moving some of the money back into the pension phase. Um, so you need to factor that into your, your scenario as well. If the younger spouse is still fully employed and hasn't satisfied a condition of release. So 
at the point in time, so you can continue to apply that drawdown strategy if you're eligible for the funds uh, until the date in which Sally becomes age pension age, which is 67 in this scenario. And at that point in time, generally what we do is we roll the funds from the Christian super account over to the pension account because once salary turns 67 and eligible for the age pension, that account, the superannuation account, it becomes a tested asset for Centrelink purposes. And so we might as well move roll back to the uh, 0% tax phase of the pension fund. And once you're in the pension phase, rather than doing lump sums that we're doing over here for, for from Sally's super account, you can now draw a regular monthly, fortnightly or quarterly amount from the pension, pension account to provide for your regular income. So uh, it, it then becomes more like getting a regular income over time. Now, just to uh, explain that these funds in the Christian super account and the Christian pension account are invested and still will continue to grow. But just so you can see how we're moving the money around, we've not assumed any growth on these funds over time. So going back to the to the um, the calculation of the age pension, so what will happen and how will this particular strategy impact um, Sam and Sally? Well, they've still got their home. They've still got $40,000 cash reserve. They've now got $700,000 in Sally's Christian Super account the house is still not tested. Uh, now the Christian super account is not tested. So there's on, their only asset here that we've included. Now you need to factor in that you, you'll have contents and cars and caravans and other things that you need to add into this asset test. But we're just using the simple example here of $40,000 cash. The lower threshold is not breached at all. There's no assets over the threshold. There's no taper rate applied. So the maximum age pension applies. Um and because only Sam is eligible, he'll get the full um, age pension for him only. Um, Sally will not be eligible. And the benefit of that is effectively um, $336.37 per fortnight or $8,745 per annum. If you extrapolate that over a 10-year period, that um, uh, Sally will be Unel- ineligible and Sam is eligible for the pension. It, it's, it could be, uh, you know, close with indexation. It could be um, close to ninety thousand dollars or even more um, over that ten-year period that they've benefited benefited from. Now, I could have used an example here that was well, um, you know, with higher uh, uh, figures, uh, and it would show a, a much greater benefit as well. But I need to also factor in that. Uh, uh, the maximum amount of uh, assets you can have as of the 1st of January, January will reduce significantly. So I just needed to factor that in as well. But that can also mean that the benefit can be more significant uh, if you apply this strategy after the 1st of January 2017. Just got a couple of questions that I'll quickly check. So Noel just asked, is, if one does all this and soon after Sally passes away, what happens to the mix then? Uh, yeah, very good question. So it depends on how you have, uh, so say for example in this scenario, if we've put all the assets in Sally's name, um, what would happen if she died? In in the, in the event of death, you would ideally have a binding death nomination in place. So it would be very clear to the trustee, so the Christian super trustees would know exactly where that money needs to go. And generally, genu- Generally, we would have that going 100% to uh, Sam. And so Sam could then choose to uh, receive those funds. He could either, and ideally, he would retain those in the superannuation environment. He wouldn't have them paid out of superannuation because he's over 65, he's not working. He would not be able to get that money back into super. So the ideal scenario would be that um, it would be a, a, a benefit, a, a benefit, a binding death benefit to uh, Sam. Uh, but not paid out of superannuation, maintained in the superannuation environment. Thanks for the question there, Noel. So there are a range of considerations. There's there's a fair bit of complexity in this strategy and there's a range of um, considerations that you need to factor in. The first one being access to the funds if, if younger spouse is still working. I mentioned that one earlier. So if in, in this scenario Sally was still working, uh, then... 
um, the, the maximum that she could draw from the funds would be at 10%, but she would need to move the funds to pension phase to draw that 10%. So it creates a little bit more complexity because you'd be rolling to um, uh, pension phase, drawing the 10%, and then rolling back again so that it wasn't tested for Centrelink purposes. So you can still manage it, but it is a bit more tricky because you're rolling backwards and forwards between pension phase and accumulation phase. You need to make sure that your cash flow needs are met and that really relates to the first item. So have, can you make regular drawdowns to, from superannuation? And just factor in that there is a, a drawdown cost of uh, $52 for each withdrawal from the um, accumulation phase. There's not that in the pension phase, just in the accumulation phase. Tax within the accumulation phase is another a drawback on this strategy. So let's look at this example. If we if we've got seven hundred thousand dollars in the super account, um, and assume that it's earning five percent, and taxed at fifteen percent on that five percent, it's taxed at a bit over five thousand dollars. So our nine thousand dollars of savings are potentially reduced by that five thousand dollars tax that's that's being paid in the accumulation phase. Uh, so. Uh, it reduces the benefit from around $9,000 per annum to $4,000 per annum. So you need to factor that in in as well because it does reduce the benefit um, uh, somewhat. But uh, to counter that, you could actually retain some more assets in the pension phase of superannuation. So rather than having the full $700 in the accumulation phase, you could have, say, $250,000 retained in the pension phase of superannuation and peg back some of those savings a bit. So you could actually have this strategy structured so that Sam and Sally are saving, uh, what would that be, in the order of um, you know $6,000 per annum over a 10-year period. So that's another consideration that you need to make. You need to, in this scenario, factor in the, any capital gains tax on the sale of shares that we, um, that we uh, sold. Additionally, you need to factor in contribution limits. In Sally's scenario, uh, we um, made a $540,000 contribution, but you need to check whether Sally's actually made contributions in the uh, non-concessional contributions in the previous uh, couple of years. And you also need to factor in if she's um, going to make government co-contributions of $1,000 in the next two financial years. If that's the case then you might drop this back to $538,000 so that a $1,000 contribution can be made each of the following financial years so that they can get the government co-contribution of $500 for each of those financial years. Um, There also is one other policy that is not likely to come into play for Sam and Sally, um, because their balance isn't likely to get into the range that's going to impact. But Labor has announced a, a superannuation policy of taxing pensions that are earning over $75,000 per annum. And we've got all of our assets in the one basket in, in, in Sally's name. If that account did grow significantly and it was more like it grew to more like $1.5 or $2 million, then it, there is a chance that at some point in time the fund might return over seventy-five thousand dollars and be taxed on some of that money. Uh, so that is a, pol- a policy of um, Labor uh, that they announced uh, earlier this year. Uh, so you, it is a factor, not necessarily in this particular scenario, but it is something to consider on larger balances where you're implementing this strategy. There also is the cash out recontribution strategy. So we. Um, uh, we effectively did a cash out from Sam's account into Sally's account. The beauty of that is that we've prob- we've cleared any tax components there, uh, but we might also want to factor in keeping um, those contribution types separate. So we might have two accounts for Sally, a 540000 non-concessional account in super and a um, $160,000 um, uh, you know, taxable account. Uh, fund that we might clear in a few years' time. So just need to factor in a a number of considerations just with the nature and the complexity of the strategy. Uh, The only other risk is if uh, it might be a loophole that the government uh, closes as well. So you could actually be 
um, that the government chooses because they're trying to reduce the amount of pensions they're paying out, they could choose to include uh, superannuation of a person under the age pension age as an asset for Centrelink purposes. So that is another consideration. Uh, William says, what about cars and caravans? Should they be bought in Sally's name? Uh, no. In, in I excluded them. I just didn't include them for simplicity, but I probably should have included a car or a caravan because it doesn't matter whose name other assets are in. Uh, they're both tested. It's just superannuation in Sally's name that is excluded from the assets test. Cars that are in Sally's name, caravans that are in Sally's name, uh, shares that are in Sally's name, uh, any other assets that are in Sally's name um, are included in the assets test. It's just superannuation that is excluded. Good question though, William. That's that's great. Um, then I'll just move on to the next um, strategy that we're talking about this evening and that is... What happens to the age pension in the event of death of a spouse? Um, <clears throat> so what happens is that you change from being tested under the couples test to the singles test. And so there are different thresholds. And what this often means is that you can then be excluded from any age pension and the associated um, health care card because you've got more assets Um, and you're a single person. And so it can often result in a reduction in the age pension or it can reduce to nil. And if it reduces to nil, then you'll lose the healthcare card and the the benefits of reduced utilities and uh, registration on vehicles and and the like. Uh, So there is a strategy that sometimes can apply. It's not, to, to be honest, it is is not that common that I've seen this strategy implemented ahead of time. But if you had a clever lawyer that was able to um, uh, provide flexibility in the will um, to skip a generation, then you, you could actually potentially do this a little bit more often. So let's look at an example. We've got Joe and Mary who look um, very similar to Sam and Sally actually. Um, but Joe and Mary are 77 and uh, 75 years of age. They're married and their assets are their own home that's worth $600,000. they have got $40,000 cash reserve. They've got 800000 in Christian pensions. And in terms of the asset test, their house is not included in the asset test. Their house, by the way, is owned jointly, which is important for the next step of the process. So currently, with 400000 each in a Christian pensions, 40000 in cash. They've got testable assets or assessable assets of $840,000. The lower th- threshold at the moment is 291500 Their assets over that threshold is 548500 The taper rate currently is $1.50. This will change on the 1st of Jan 2017. And so their um, fortnightly pension will reduce by 82275 the maximum that they could be receiving is the 100, uh, 1307 And so their pension, their combined pension, because they're both eligible for the pension, is $448.25 per fortnight. That's what they're currently getting. Now, what would happen in the event of um, Joe passing away? So now Joe's uh, unfortunately passed away. Uh, Mary survived him. How would things now play out now as i said earlier their house is owned jointly so the house will automatically go into uh, mary's name their bank account is owned jointly so that'll automatically transfer across to being mary's name their superannuation pensions they've set their pensions up as reversionary beneficiaries so on the event of death um the four hundred thousand dollar pension that Joe was receiving automatically reverts over to Mary. So she effectively now has $800,000 worth of Christian pensions. Same again, the house is excluded from the assets test, but the other assets are tested. So $800,000 plus $40,000 means that it's tested. But this time there's a lower threshold because she's a single, um, Mary is now a single homeowner. And therefore, the thresholds, the asset test threshold is 205500 And in this case, as we'll find out, 
is that she's 634500 over that threshold, which then means that she's going to reduce her pension to the point that the maximum pension she can get is going to be, sorry, the taper rate exceeds the maximum pension, so she'll get no pension. She'll come right off the age pension. Now, a strategy that could potentially apply is that if if Mary and Joe decided ahead of time that when they were a single person um, in the event of one or the other person and they were happy to um, um, direct their pension account in this example to their children, then they could actually uh, see that money go directly to their children and then... um, in that case, Mary would still be eligible for a part pension. So let's look at that example. So rather than Mary uh, coming totally off the age pension, there's a scenario where she could potentially maintain access to it. And it involves um, Joe having a binding nomination on his $400,000 Christian pension to his four adult children. So in, so in this case... Uh, Joe dies, but the 400,000 is divided four ways, 100,000 each to his four adult children. There is a consideration here that if his uh, pension money is what we call taxable components, there may be some tax payable on that, although there may be some anti-detriment benefits that may be able to offset that. Offset that. But ideally, in this scenario, you would have cleared the taxable components in his pension uh, before setting up these binding nominations to his four adult children. So in this scenario, um, Joe's died. He's, he's directed $400,000 of his Christian pension to his four adult children, $100,000 each. Mary's maintained the home. She's also maintained the um, $40,000 in her bank account. But rather than $800,000 in pension, she's got $400,000 because Joe has d- directed his to his his children, his adult children. Again, his house is not tested, but this time, rather than eight hundred and forty, because we've um, directed four hundred thousand dollars to uh, uh, Joe's adult children, uh, and I'm assuming here that they're Mary's adult children as well. Um, the the assessable assets are only four hundred and forty thousand dollars. The amount over the lower threshold is two hundred thirty four five hundred. The taper rate at the current rate of $1.50 is three hundred and fifty one seventy five. That's the amount the the fortnightly amount that the maximum age pension of eight hundred and sixty seven will be reduced by. So now Mary is able to get um, an age pension of five hundred and fifteen twenty five on a fortnightly uh, basis instead of nil, and she'll also receive the a um, the healthcare card. So on a per annum basis, that's uh, thirteen thousand, nearly thirteen thousand four hundred dollars per annum, and she also gets the benefit of the health healthcare card. So it is a benefit of sixty, nearly sixty seven thousand dollars over five years. Uh, but you do need to factor in that um, Mary needs to make sure that she's able to provide for her herself um, over the next few years. Um, so she needs to make sure that um, you know they say that a comfortable retirement for somebody who's uh, single is around that forty thousand dollar mark. She needs to re- make sure that she her four hundred thousand dollars in her Christian pension account can make up the difference between what she'll get from the age pension and um, uh, and what uh, so what she can uh, get from the age pension and what she draws from her super account. Make sure that that her money lasts long enough to provide for that over time. So she would be needing to draw down another, uh, what, $27,000 from the account here. So the balance, assuming that it's in a balance type fund, the balance of the $400,000 would go down over time. Uh, But she's likely to be able to provide for her uh, her, uh, living expenses over her expected life expectancy. It's where she um, lives longer uh, that that could be a challenge, but I guess that ideally is where the adult children would um, assist I- in that scenario. So a few considerations for this particular strategy is that you need to make sure, as I mentioned, that you've got sufficient funds to live on. You don't want to gift all your funds and be on the age pension but not have enough funds to live on. I did also mention that 
if there are taxable components in Joe's superannuation account, then there may be some death benefits tax uh, payable on that money, and it's at a rate of 17%. There may be anti-detriment benefits that can reduce that, but it is well worth considering that as well. Um, We also need to factor in that there's a reduced assets threshold as of the 1st of January 2017. So... um, I think it's about 537000 for a single. If you've got assets over that figure, you'll go fully off the age pension. And for a couple, it's 823000 down from $1.16 million. Um, so you need to factor that in. If you want to know more about that, then go back to the previous webinar recording. And you also need to, or Mary needs to also consider that she needs to pay for an accommodation bond if she needs to move into aged care at some point in time. But in this scenario, she could either lease the family home or sell the family home and she should be able to uh, accommodate that um, accommodation bond. So there shouldn't be too much of an issue here. I think the biggest question is really about um, has she is she maintaining sufficient funds to live on? But is a scenario where she could potentially be getting, if you're thinking, as, um, as a family whole, um, she's getting an additional $13,400 per annum, whereas she wouldn't have been doing that if this strategy hadn't been applied. There are other ways of doing it. So you can sometimes, if there are assets outside of superannuation, you can structure the, the will such that it passes to the next generation. But the, the key thing is that it, it wouldn't work in this scenario if there was a binding death nomination uh, to Mary so that the superannuation was paid to Mary and then Mary passed that money on to her four adult children because then that $400,000 would be caught in Centrelink gifting rules which we talked about in the last webinar. So just another strategy there um, that is not, I don't see it implemented that often because it's you need to be involved in the estate planning or the wealth transfer process and consider it when you're thinking about wills but it is something that um, is well worth uh, considering um, uh, uh, for those people who can identify that that might be their particular scenario. Yeah, this is just clarifying those assets thresholds. Um, so um, as we mentioned, uh, the upper left le- upper level, so the cutoff threshold, if you've got assets over these amounts, then you're going to not be able, you're going to be excluded from the age pension as of the 1st of January 2015. So for a single homeowner, the asset threshold is reducing from 783500 to 547000 And for a couple homeowner, if you've got assets currently under $1.163 million, then you'd be eligible for a part pension, but that's going to reduce to 823000 Really important to understand that change um, if you are eligible for the age pension uh, before that date or even after that date. Uh, if you're wanting further assistance, then uh, call the Christian Super Help Desk, one 360 Go to the Christian Super website. Uh, previous, the recording of this webinar and other webinars will be available soon at uh, this website. If you want personal advice, then uh, if just lodge a contact via my website or I think there's a survey at the end of this uh, webinar that you can say, please call me or contact me, I can do that. Or you give us a call on one 275 428 The other really helpful resource when, with anything to do with Centrelink is the human Department of Human Services website, humanservices.gov.au. Just search on the age pension and there's lots of information there for you. Uh, you can call the Senior Australian number on 1323, sorry, 132300. Financial Information Services Offices are really good resources as well. You can book an appointment with them. Uh, they're free consultations with a Financial Information Services Officer. You can use an Express Plus app if you're a uh, you know mobile smartphone type person. It's a useful thing. And if you're wanting to understand how much age pension you're uh, going to receive or un- under your particular scenario, there is also a rate estimator on the on the um, I think uh, on the Centrelink side, I think if you go to human services and search on rate estimators or calculators, you'll get to this or, or, or just follow this particular link here. Um, you can either get that from the slides or from the recording or just search on rate estimator on the human services website. So there are all the um, other links or resources that are available to you. I'll just ask Jim answer Jim's question who asked about the taper rates. So I just mentioned uh, back here about these taper rates, how they're changing. Um, 
as of the 1st of Jan 2017. um, Jim's question really is about um, with a change of treasurer, has there been a um, change in that policy and where do the former position pension holders now stand now uh with the the, the change of treasurer he, he's not announced any change to this particular strategy or this particular policy sorry um it is it still remains in place so that in the on the 1st of uh, jan 2017 the taper rate will increase from a dollar 50 to three dollars as it was pre howard and costello um uh, Labor supported this policy, so it was a bipartisan change. Um, uh, I don't think this is going to change. Um, I haven't seen uh, or heard anything about this policy changing. So, Jim, unfortunately, um, uh, this might mean that uh, if you're over those thresholds, then you'll, you'll come off the assets uh, test. In terms of um, benefits that you still might be eligible for, if you are ineligible for the age pension or if you are eligible pre the 1st of Jan 2017, uh, you could actually still maintain that healthcare card um, beyond that if you were eligible for the age pension prior to the 1st of Jan 2017. So factor that in. Um, or if you do, if you're not eligible, then you consider applying for the Commonwealth Seniors Healthcare Card because that um, also has some benefits associated with it. There is an income test associated with that, um, uh, but consider applying for that if you do become ineligible for the age pension as of the 1st of Jan 2017. Uh, Kerry says, are you better to sell a commercial unit and put the funds into super or rent it out and have a small income? Uh, It really depends on your particular scenario. It's... um, uh, it's a pretty hard one to answer without knowing your full details. Often it is worthwhile considering if you're reaching that 65 years of age and thinking about ceasing work to consider whether that's going to be a better thing for you to get the money into super. Although if it's a commercial property, if it's a business real property, then you could consider transferring it into super because you can do that with business real property. You can't do it with residential real estate so that would be a potential opportunity for you Kerry Um, Barbara this is a a long question that Barbara asked um, basically trying to understand what uh, benefits she'll be eligible for she's effectively saying that she's um, not likely to be eligible under the assets test which means that you're not going to receive an an age pension Um, but uh, you could try to apply for the Commonwealth Seniors Healthcare Card. If you want to know a little bit more about the rules about that, then go back to the webinar recording at cornerstonewealth.com.au forward slash Centrelink 2015. Uh, but you could also, if you wanted to, you could check your eligibility for the age pension using the uh, rates estimator on the uh, Human Services website. It actually looks like it's on the Centrelink website there. Uh, Janet asks, I would like to, I'd like information regarding the best option for my allocated pension. Should I be considering moving from 100% investment in either ethical, stable or ethical balance? Yeah, when you're in pension phase, if you're in an allocated pension, I really like the idea of, and I've jumped to the next slide, but this is the link um, for Jeanette actually that I've put under John's name here, is go to cornerstonewealth.com.au forward slash buffer. And this explains the strategy whereby you, uh, we, we suggest that you hold, and I'll just quickly draw it here, uh, but I'll go back to Janet's um, slide here. So what we suggest is that it's a prudent thing to um, to sometimes move back a notch in terms of risk when you move to pension phase. But the other thing you can do, if you've got an, an age, uh, sorry, an allocated pension, Often what we do, you've got to draw a minimum amount out of that each year. So what we often say is if you if you hold uh, two to five years pension payments, if it's two years pension payments and you're 65, then you've got to drive, draw 5% of the balance each year. So two years pension payments would make up 10% of the balance of the fund. If you hold two, 10% of that in cash and you hold the rest in, in ethical balance or ethical stable for example uh, that means this um, this these funds here can go up and down in value and you don't have to worry about it because you'll know that your pension payments are going to be paid using the cash option uh, 
as markets increase, this proportion will go out of balance or as you use the cash, it'll get out of out of balance. So rather than being 90-10, it might be 95-5. And at that point in time, and ideally at a high point in the market, you might move funds across to the catch option to replenish it. But go to that website. Um, uh, go to that, uh, sorry, go to this um, link and, and we explain a, a, a lot. Go into, it's about an eight minute video that explains it in a bit more detail for you. So, John's question, it doesn't actually apply to this thing. I've put that on the wrong page. That relates to the previous question. Um, John's saying, I'm 67 years of age and five, uh, and five months, and my wife is 59 and 10 months. Do we possibly qualify for a part pension and what are my options? Thanks, John. Yes, you're a classic example of the strategy that we talked through this, uh, this evening, uh, where. Um, Particularly if you're both retired, for example, or you're earning less than $75,000 per annum, you're likely to receive a part pension uh, depending on what assets you have. Uh, so, uh, John, if, if you are in that category, I would suggest applying for the age pension ASAP. You can do that by calling the 132300 line and if you say, I want to apply for the age pension, it's at that date that you'll be eligible. If you get your paperwork in in the next two weeks, they'll backdate it to that that particular date that you called in and applied. Wendy says, what happens if I don't qualify for the pension and my situation changes? Can I reapply at a later date, e.g. if I re- reduce my assets by purchasing a more expensive family home? Yes, you can update your... Uh, details as they change. Um, if your bank balances go up and down by more than two thousand dollars, then you're supposed to notify Centrelink. Um, if you purchase a more expensive home and then more assets are therefore excluded from the assets test, then uh, and you become eligible for the pension, then you can apply at that point in time. Um, so yes, uh, you can if your circumstances change. In fact, during the GFC, as assets values fell, a lot more people became eligible for the age pension and therefore it put more of a strain on the government um, uh, to pay out more pensions during that period as well. And David asks, I am 63 and still working. Can my wife, who is also 63, apply for the pension as she is unemployed? Uh, well, it doesn't look like either of you are eligible for the age pension because um, a male's um, age pension age is 65 and um, uh, so I don't think either of would, would, you would be eligible for the age pension uh, unless unless um, your wife is eligible. But it doesn't look like either would uh, if you are. Uh, but the only thing that you could do here is apply for like the likes of new start allowance or disability support if you're eligible for that. Um, otherwise, it would be looks like you wouldn't be eligible for the age pension unless your wife is based on her uh, date of birth um, uh, being eligible a little bit earlier. Um, thanks for the question, David. Uh, Peter asks, if you buy a lease in to a retirement village, is the entry fee part of your assets or does it become your residence for assessment purposes? Uh, generally, uh, retirement villages um, uh, end up uh, being uh, the, the equivalent of your family home and excluded from the assets test. Um, that's generally how it works. There may be exceptions to that. Uh, there are the oh, caravan park rules where um, th- 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 some people um, utilize this definition that of, a, of a caravan park and therefore they don't ha- that they can be considered non homeowners and can get an advantage there uh, but generally retirement villages it's considered your um, your your home and therefore excluded from the assets test Kathy asked if we use borrowed monies to invest in superannuation in is the interest tax deductible in the current years uh, no the deductibility of interest is uh, on borrowed monies relates to what the money is used for. So if it's used for income producing purposes in your own name, then it's tax deductible. So if you borrow funds to invest in shares, then it's an investment um, and the interest is tax deductible. If you borrow funds to invest in a property that's an investment and is generating income, you can deduct that um, interest uh, f- uh, from the um, you know the rental income or even your own personal income in Australia uh, but where money is borrowed to put into superannuation uh, it's not tax deductible 
um, you would just it would just be interest payable. Uh, so so if you've borrowed a hundred thousand dollars, you're paying five percent interest or five thousand dollars per annum, and you've put that hundred thousand dollars into super. Uh, that's um, that five thousand dollars interest each year is not considered a tax deduction on your personal income tax return. Uh, thanks very much for for being part of it and. Um, Have a great Christmas and I might see you in the new year. Uh, God bless.